Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm glad you stuck it out through the rest of the day. Um, try not to make this too taxing, um, <laughs> because we might about run out of energy. Uh, but I'm talking about uh, something that I tried in the fall semester, uh, which was uh, in the three sections that we teach uh, our introductory physics class. Uh, one of them was offered as a flipped classroom with a blended learning model. So um, I'll be talking about uh, what I saw in teaching those different sections. All right, so in the spirit of a flipped classroom, I figured I would just give you the results first. Um, and then I can tell you about actually the, the implementation. I, the main idea of the results is that uh, this is a class that had a total of 40 students. Um, within that uncertainty, there is really nothing you can say about whether uh, they do better with a flipped classroom or not, which I think is sort of understandable. If you give students a reasonable set of learning tools, then at least my experience is that they'll learn at the level that they felt like learning to start with. And, uh, and exactly how it's presented isn't likely to change that a whole lot. So uh, what I've put up for you is the course grades on a four-point scale. And the error bars are uh, what we call in physics the standard deviation of the mean. So uh, it's the standard deviation of all the scores within that class, but then divided by the square root of the number of students, because the more students you have, the better certainty you have about what the average is. Um, and you can do all kinds of things to make those bars move around. Uh, for example, there were five students who were in originally the regular lecture section, and after the first of three exams, they decided they'd rather be in the flipped classroom. So those ones are not in this set, but they could be. Um, or if you say, like, just took out the one student who uh, stopped coming um, at all, you know, that not being necessarily quite a fair test of things in the first semester of freshman year, students stop coming for all kinds of reasons that usually have very little to do with the class. Um, and so that also just totally changes around. So um, we, we could do this on a much larger scale. My, my bet is that you still wouldn't find a very strong effect in any of it. So, so that's the end for the comparison. Then I'll tell you about the class. And feel free to ask questions along the way if you have them. All right, so um, at Colgate University, we're a liberal arts college. Um, we don't have any engineering. Um, so, and we have a separate section for students in the biological sciences, a separate class of, of algebra-based instead of calculus-based physics. So uh, all 40 students that you saw there are thinking about a physics major, with only a few small exceptions. So uh, this course that I'm telling you about is the first semester course along the way to a physics major. Uh, we don't teach, for those of you who know about physics, uh, we don't teach quite the normal class first. Normally, you would start with an introduction to mechanics. We put that second for a number of reasons that we can talk about later if you want to. Um, and this is a class that we call Atoms and Waves that covers a lot of sort of 20th century physics with a touch of 21st century at the end. Um, and as a, you can see our whole major there, just because I pulled that off another view graph that I have. So if you, um, if you want to see how it fits in. Uh, the, the main thing, I guess, to understand is that over the course of the first two years, we're trying to get the students to have a foundation in physics that will allow them to take any of the upper level classes that we teach because uh, they are only taught in alternate years. So they only have one crack at all of those upper level classes. So our, our curriculum is fairly carefully structured to make that possible. Yes? Is your electricity and magnetism then that you listen to YouTube, is that a la a typical intro level? Or yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's slightly higher because by that point, they're all either in Calc 3 or have Calc 3. But it's um, not all of the level of things, right? No, there's a Griffiths later on in one of those three upper level electives. And again, if you're curious about what we do in the class, this only works for physicists, but I see a number of you in the room. So there you are. Uh, you can see the kinds of topics that we cover. Uh, the, the sort of overall theme is how do you know if something is an atom that is something countable or discrete or quantized or something that's a wave? And what's, what's the evidence for things being either one of those? And then at the very end, because it's so cool, we teach them a little bit about the nature of reality and Bell's inequalities and the fact that um, properties of matter don't exist until they're measured. Don't know if I'm telling you anything new there. Uh, it's not you know, the Heisenberg and Sinky principle that you thought about as like a measurement limit that you can't really measure things exactly. That it's, it's a reality limit. 
Sorry. <laughs> all right. So uh, could I you know, have a class run? Uh, this is if you're in one of the regular two sections. Uh, so in past years, we always taught this with a uh, lecture twice a week that everyone shows up to, and then recitation twice a week that's grouped into three different groups. So we have a lot of faculty time going into this class because the lecture might be in the range of 35 to 45 students, and then the recitations are going to be in the range of 12 to 16 students. And we call them a recitation, but they're problem-solving sessions. Um, so that, that's the standard class. Uh, of course, lab could be any day of the week. Um, and you'd see the same professor for your recitation and for your lab, whereas for the lecture you'd be in a big group. So uh, what I realized is that this is kind of halfway flipped already, um, and all we have to do is get rid of the lecture part of it, and then uh, it just in order to not have to fight with our administration as to whether or not it should count as a full class if it's fewer hours per week, it's actually easier if you have more time to teach anyhow. So it fits into our course schedule to just extend the recitation into the full hour and 15 minutes slot that we have. And then there was time to do demos and to keep the kids up to date with the announcements and all of that kind of stuff. So that's what you do if you have a flipped classroom in my class. And then there's, of course, things to do outside of class also. All right. So when you yes. said you had the three sections and only one was broken. Yes. The others kept to that original schedule with the other the two lectures and the two lectures. Right. Absolutely. And I should tell you now that uh, the students mostly chose which one to be in, although they were getting some encouragement towards the, uh, as drop ag was going on and there was limited space. But no one was forced into a section that they didn't want to be in. All right, and so this was easier to do than it might be if you were starting from scratch because we already had uh, these recitation problems that I've been coming up with over the years. So, so for each topic, we have a, a long list of questions that are kind of designed to be worked on in groups in the presence of an instructor that might lead them from the end of lecture, the part that we always know we won't quite get to, um, and then into solving problems that are supposed to sort of lead them into homework eventually. Um, so both sections used these existing recitation questions. And also, just so you know, both sections had everything else the same. Uh, we actually have twice weekly um, homework for the whole first year because it just seems to go a little easier for freshmen that way. Um, there's a weekly lab, there's three tests, there's a final exam, everyone wants the same for all of that. Um, so then uh, the way it worked for the students who were in the flipped classroom, uh, we have Moodle at Colgate, uh, and it's similar to Blackboard and all those other things that you've used. Um, so the content was hosted on Moodle, and this is, on the left is a screenshot of what the students would see when they went into this section. This is also probably a good time to tell you that everyone had the same Moodle page for the class. So the students who were in the lecture section also had these available to them, and I'll come back to that a little bit if there's time, but one thing I should say is that at the beginning of the semester, or before the beginning of the semester, it dawned on me that there was going to be an attendance problem, because every Monday and Wednesday at 9 o'clock when your alarm went off, you would start to think, oh, I'm just going to watch the video this week, even if you were in the lecture section. So, so I, and like normally, I made lectures uh, mandatory, and they had a few uh, allowable misses. But because the videos were there, I, I had to make it so that lecture attendance was mandatory. Uh, so um, if you open this part of the Moodle page, then you get a video clip. Um, I was aiming at about five minutes. You know, they go like two minutes. There's a couple as long as 10 or 11 minutes when there was a really long concept to get through. Uh, you see a lovely picture of me, the talking head on the bottom corner of the page. So I, I, this is just, um, you know, maybe using this. Uh, mostly, there's a few different, but most of them are me sitting at my desk, occasionally me standing up and showing you how a demo works, but most of the demos I did during the uh, recitation class instead. Um, and, uh, and mostly with the PowerPoint on the screen in the background, I tried a little bit of uh, having a tablet that I was writing on. It, it was actually just really painful um, to see someone writing. Uh, so usually if I was going to do that, actually I ended up writing 
and then cutting out from the video the part where I was writing it and just coming right back in with the after it was written. Um, maybe some of you are better at writing and talking at the same time than I am, but that was how it worked for me. Uh, and then uh, after each section, there's some multiple choice questions. So the students who were in the flipped classroom section got their grade from answering the multiple choice questions. Uh, they had to get 60% right over the course of the semester. Um, this turned out to be a little bit trickier than I thought, but everyone who was trying squeaked by. Um, the, I, the multiple choice questions are a lot of work to come up with. Uh, I had a mixture of them. Actually, the one that you see there is one of the absolute gimmies. It's like on the chart that's right there in the lecture video, and then you just have to pull out the answer. So that was an are you awake question. Um, <laughs> there, <laughs> there were also, uh, I actually really enjoyed the multiple choice questions for the chance to ask the students the question that was going to draw the wrong answer that I knew I was going to get. And so this gave them a chance to get that wrong answer out of their systems. And after each video, after each question, there's actually another video almost always that has the solution to the question. So then I had the chance to tell them why that was wrong. And um, yeah, so that's a, that's a rewarding thing to be able to do. And some that required you know, some deeper thinking, and most of the students would get it wrong. But again, they got to watch the video after that to see what the right answer was. Uh, and then at the end of the semester, I, I tried a, a survey. Um, I didn't really have enough time to construct it as well as I would have liked to. So for example, I can't exactly compare the uh, flipped classroom with the non-flipped classroom because I didn't quite ask the same questions. Uh, so, uh, first of all, the, the biggest thank you uh, student reaction was just the fact that the 12 students grew to 17 after the first exam. Um, and also, I don't know if I put it up there, uh, for students who weren't in the flipped classroom, uh, they still said that they'd watched a fair amount of, of videos. Um, so uh, reasons, for, so at first I wanted to know why they enrolled because uh, I wanted to know if that correlated with um, what they thought about the flipped classroom. Uh, it actually, um, there were 85% uh, of jumping to the end said I would choose a flipped classroom again. Uh, the ones who didn't say they would choose a flipped classroom again were all ones who had volunteered for it. The ones who were somewhat coerced into the flipped classroom all were actually really happy with it in the end. That's probably just um, small numbers, uh, but it, it does tell you that uh, students are both conservative and pliable. I think. So when you're seeing that 33% in the standard classroom say that they would choose a flipped classroom, I'd say there's a really good chance that most of those would be perfectly happy with it. Um, and, and the reasons they were giving for not wanting a flipped classroom were reasons that didn't actually quite make sense because they would say, I want to be able to stop and ask a question in lecture. And they were asking this at the end of the semester when they should have known that they don't ask questions in lecture. Um, but there, there aren't that many questions asked in lecture. I try as I might to get them to. Um, so I, I think most of them would be perfectly happy with it. Uh, they they okay. would be in high school to discuss it before. Yes, yeah, and that, was, that surprised me. But there were, you know, these were almost all first year students, and the ones who said that they'd had it before were first year students. I think I have maybe one more slide. Uh, so, so here, again, the survey was not terribly well constructed, whoops, um, so I, I can't quite uh, parse how they were answering these questions. Uh, I, I thought I knew how they were going to answer, but then the percentages don't add up. Um, so in the, in the standard section, uh, most of, uh, actually they reported surprisingly high usage of the textbook. I didn't expect that at all. Maybe they thought that was the right answer. Um, I mean, it was anonymous, but still, they, they know what the right answer is. They're, they've been in school for a lot of years. Uh, so, so, like, I, I thought that when I was saying read the assignment, but I meant read the assignment. But then here I have 50% who said uh, either that they flipped through the book to look for equations that were useful or examples, or that they just used it for finding the homework problems. Um, so so you, can't, you can't do that, but, you know, whatever. 
Um, yeah, 34% watched part of the lecture video. I should say what these percentages mean, because I told them to answer. There were, in the end, I think 24 lectures for the class, because some classes, some weeks got used up for exams and things. So there were 24 lectures, so I asked them to say, out of the 24 lectures, how many times did you read the assignment after the recitation? Uh, so that percent is the percent of possible over the whole class. All right, and in the, in the flipped classroom, 55% uh, of them said that they read this assignment carefully, uh, which I was surprised by. Right, and we think that's, that's all I have. Yeah. Okay. So I believe we agreed that we have a little bit of questions. Yeah, we have a, a few minutes for questions for Beth, and then we'll have time for questions for all three speakers at the end. So what do you think you'll do different next time? Will there be a next time? Um, I think there will be a next time. Uh, next year I'll be teaching in Uganda on a Fulbright grant, and there I can't do this at all. Um, so next time uh, is up to some other instructor. When I come back, I, I'm not quite sure. I, I think I will do it again. I think that I will certainly, on the multiple choice questions, uh, work to label them so that the students will be less surprised that they were wrong, so that I'll, I'll have categories of, like, this one should be obvious, this one's just stretch. You know, I think it's worthwhile. Yeah? Is there a difference in the amount of time that it took to prepare um, the traditional class versus the flip class? <laughs> oh, well, I said, so once the lecture videos are done, preparing for class is actually falling off log. I, I would uh, get, I would go on to Moodle, download the gradebook. This is the only thing I've ever used the Moodle gradebook for. I, I'm not terribly fond of it, but it was easy for this purpose. So I could see, first of all, how long the students had the videos open, which was sort of enlightening. You know, the way they did it for 12 minutes, you kind of knew what was going on, but that didn't happen very often. Um, and, uh, well, because they could read the book first, but usually they no, were just I'm guessing. Just really, I could only see that they accessed it. I hadn't quite figured out how to see how long they had it. Oh, no, it told me how long they had it open, but I can't tell you how it was done because I didn't do it myself. Uh, I, um, <laughs> so, uh, wait, where were we? Sorry. I was just wondering about the amount of time to prepare a class. Oh, right, right. So, um, to make a lecture video, uh, by the time I got good at it, I could do it in three or four hours. Um, and, but then they are, in fact, pretty much good forever, although, of course, I have all these things that I want to fix in them. Um, but then once they're made, preparing for and the recitation questions are done, and I know this stuff really well. I've, I've learned it. So um, I, I could prepare for these recitations like in 10 minutes. Uh, and also, you know, another benefit to the videos that I meant to say is that uh, it turns out that a 15-minute lecture um, that you'd run out of time at the end and you really needed 60 or 65 minutes to get done is 30 minutes of video. And I've heard people say that it's much shorter than that, but I talk really slowly on the video. I'm like, what I'm doing now? <laughs> One thing, uh, I guess I did this in my class. Uh -huh. um, we have to teach the students how to watch the videos. In other words, how to, not just to watch them, because they just watch the videos, to be honest, I don't know if they're going to take that much hits. Uh -huh. They need to take notes as well. It's something that they didn't do at the beginning. And we made sure that you know, we looked at what they've written. That seems to have a big impact. Well, interesting. I didn't try that. I, I think the multiple choice questions serve part of that, in that they, they knew when they didn't catch it. But it's Sorry? Did you deliver content through the video or was it all multiple choice? Oh, no, no, no. It was, it was content followed by a multiple choice question or two. I, I thought more of them would watch it with each other's company, and I tried encouraging that during the semester so they could talk about it with each other. That didn't happen very much, but a little bit. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I noticed and from your first slide, it might be sort of small numbers, but your error bar on your flip classroom was the largest. Yeah. Do you think that it's something that maybe some students learn very well by this methodology and some are quite poor? Or, um, or I lot? definitely had a big scatter. I had some of the very best students in the class, and I had the ones who by spring semester really were not. I, I followed them up, and how they did in the fall was a great predictor of how they were going to do in the spring, as you might think, but it didn't seem to vary between the sections. Um, I, I, I thought that what I saw was just uh, what they were coming in with and what they were bringing into the class and how, how hard they were willing to work. Um, and wasn't so much kids that just stopped watching videos 
because they, you know, there's students who drop out for various reasons from the lecture section, from the video section. So, I, but I was kind of blessed with having some of the best students who thought that uh, lecture videos would be a great way to learn. And that might be small numbers too. I think we should hold any other questions to the end if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, and now we'll have to do it.